Hi, folks. And uh, I have the, the chat up on screen, but I'm going to remove that uh, temporarily by chat. I can still see it, though. Just people watching who, for some reason, aren't looking at the chat in their own windows can't see it. So it's kind of, it's kind of a power thing. I'll admit that. Anyway, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Ask Away. And uh, it's just me. This time, the, uh, the stuffy cast uh, is not joining me again, so you're going to have to just make do with this. Um, I hope everybody who uh, celebrated Christmas had a nice one. And uh, if you are celebrating Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or, or another holiday that is ongoing that I don't know about or haven't thought of, I hope you have a good one of those too, whatever you're celebrating. Um, and uh, as usual, I will, be asked, I will be answering questions that were submitted by my Patreon patrons first. And... Um, then we will turn to questions from the live chat. But first, I have one little bit of, of business here to do before I go to the patron questions. And uh, I just need to take care of this very quickly. And what I'm doing is I am, I am uh, adding the PayPal link belonging to my friend Leto Anor, who is in the live chat with us. And I am adding that to the description of this video that you are watching right now, uh, so that if you want to go to her PayPal and make a small or maybe even a large donation uh, to help her, uh, her with expenses uh, relating to the, uh, uh, the death of her cat just recently, uh, you, can, uh, you can do that. And I would encourage you to do that because uh, we all love Leto and we're all really, 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 really bummed and sorry um, about Merlin. So um, yeah, go, go help out. And I'll, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to plug the, uh, uh, the charity links at the end of the show like I usually do anyway. But just since it came up at the beginning, I just added Leto's PayPal to the uh, to the d the video description. So anybody who has some extra, you know, cash left over the holidays, you want to help out somebody who needs a little bit of a hand, um, consider doing that. Now, on to the questions from my very fine Patreon patrons. First is from Neo Normy. Yes, that's me in the corner building my religion. Two points, and then there's a, a video link. Uh, give the YouTube video of The Force Unleashed a look, as it's better than the Disney trilogy. And you blocked me on Twitter, which was odd, as there wasn't a reason, given I'm Shy Boria on there, and one of my names is Steve, and I'm a massive J.G. Ballard and Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft fan. Well, first of all, um, earlier today I unblocked you, so I apologize for that. Um, I can't think of why you would have been blocked other than maybe, um, if it, I, did you, you may have replied in, in a thread of one of my Star Wars related threads recently and I didn't know, I didn't recognize the name, didn't know it was you and maybe if you said something, uh, uh you know, like critical of, of a, of, of a movie I had praised or something, uh, I might have mistaken you for a troll and just said to hell with it and blocked you. So if, whatever, however it happened, I apologize. And, and you're unblocked. And I watched a few minutes of the video you linked. Um, actually I watched a few minutes of the, of the version you linked to me. And then I jumped over to another video that was a comp, just a compilation of cutscenes from the same video game. Uh, which was a lot shorter because the one you gave me was almost two hours and like half of it was just gameplay. And that just, you know, like I, I know a lot of people really enjoy that and I'm not trying to say that, you know, you shouldn't enjoy it, but it's not my cup of tea at all. So I, and even the, the cut scenes, I only got about halfway through it. If, if even that far, I mean, I'm sure if I were playing the game, it would be awesome. Like if I, cause I've, I've read and heard that it's, it's that the, that star Wars game, uh, Force Unleashed is is a really really good game, and a lot of people have been singing its praises for years. But I've never played it, and I'm sure if I did play it, I would think it was great. But having not played it, just watching the cutscenes, uh, just it didn't really grab me. So, but I'm sure if I had played the game, I would think it was awesome. So, thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, next question is from John Gingris. Hi, today the 27th, the day you're presumably reading this, is my birthday. Birthdays around Christmas aren't great, but Ask Aways are. Or should that be asks away? My question is this. If you were to plot out the post-Star Trek TNG careers of the main TNG cast, what would they do and where would they end up? Well, first of all, happy birthday. Uh, yeah, I, I imagine it is uh, not so great 
to have a birthday close to uh, to Christmas. So condolences on that. But but happy birthday and thank you for saying nice things about ask away. And I, I think ask aways would be the proper plural. Asks away. That that sounds like you're 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 describing something in the present tense. You know, like and then he just asks away. Like ask aways is good. Anyway. Um, if I could plot out, I, I assume you mean the characters, not the people, because like it, they would all go on to be very successful actors. Uh, I'm going to assume you mean the characters. And uh, I was thinking about this a couple of days ago. I'm toying with the idea for maybe a future Not Actually Trek Actually video um, of coming up with like rewrites of the TNG movies. Even though I, I overall I enjoyed the TNG movies, uh, but one of the things that has always kind of annoyed me about the TNG movies, even when I have liked them, is how the Enterprise crew was just sort of frozen in amber, and everybody just kept whatever their job was <laughs> at the end of the series for the rest of the movies, right? And that, that just, that always seemed kind of unfair to me. It's like, you're, you're making a movie. You're not doing a weekly TV series. You make a movie every two or three years. There's no reason why the people aboard the Enterprise E, by the time we get to the first contact film, uh, why, why they have to be living on the ship all the time. Like you can have them get promoted and move off and do other things. And then the events of the film can bring them back together. So you would still want to have everybody in the movie, but they don't all have to be serving on the enterprise in their exact same job that they've always had. So that felt like a missed opportunity to me. So if I were going to plot out the careers of the TNG, you know, the, like the senior staff on the enterprise, post TNG, the first thing I would do is Riker would get promoted to captain. Data would at least get promoted to first officer. And maybe even he would get promoted to captain. Jordy would get promoted. Worf ended up on Deep Space Nine. I would leave Worf on Deep Space Nine and just, you know, kind of, I would just do Worf kind of the way they did him in the movies, except I would try to come up with better reasons for him to be involved in the story. I and mean, I would still want Worf to be in the movies. Obviously, I love Worf. Um, but maybe come up with a little bit of a better reason for him to be reuniting with his pals from the Enterprise instead of, oh, I was in the neighborhood and I thought I'd stop by, which I believe is the reason that he is there during the events of Star Trek Insurrection. So I would think maybe after Generations, well, we'll let Generations be pretty much as it is because Generations was released the, the same year that the show ended. So there's not a lot of time in between. And we, I, I'm, I don't think we're meant to think that a lot of time has passed for the characters either. So we'll leave Generations more or less as is, but then starting with First Contact, you can have, well, Riker has his own ship and maybe um, maybe Deanna has, has either moved on with him to, to be with him, either platonically because he wanted an, a ship's counselor, or maybe they rekindled their romance, or maybe Deanna stayed behind on the Enterprise. And Riker and her have uh, have realized, now that they're not serving on the same ship together, that they really miss each other. Maybe they that's what makes them decide they want to be together. Or, you know, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, one of the first things I would do is make sure that Riker had his own ship. Um, and And the stories of the films would be plotted in such a way that Riker and whoever else was no longer serving on the Enterprise would be brought back in for the story. So you would have the whole cast back together for, for the movie, but they wouldn't all still be serving on the Enterprise under Picard. I would leave Picard captain of the Enterprise. I think he would stay the captain of the Enterprise until he retired is how I would do it. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting exercise, an interesting sort of nerdy thought experiment. But one of the things that has always kind of felt like a missed opportunity was that they didn't change anybody, uh, at least not change anybody's position or career status uh, for the movies. I, I would want to do a lot more of that. Uh, General Contact Unit Problem Child. Remember last stream, I said I felt sick after the UK election result. After that, I made it worse by getting really drunk. I was actually in the process of that when I was interrogating Millicent. I ended up feeling sick for days depression and hangover combined. One of the things that made me feel the worst is the fact that my father, a person I see every day, voted Tory. I keep myself from yelling at him constantly by telling myself stuff like, dad doesn't know much about politics, history, he doesn't know any better. My brother, a fellow leftist, 
has told me he thinks of dad's political views the same way. Is it wrong or patronizing to assume anyone you know who votes for Trump or Boris only did it because they're too dumb to know better? I think it might be a thing left-wing people do so we can deal with having to continue relationships with conservatives. If we can tell ourselves they're idiots, it means they're not necessarily evil. I mean, it's easier to not respect my father's intelligence and keep loving him than respect his choices and hate him. P.S. With regard to that Millicent thing, your wife ain't half bad at improv. Well, thank you for the the compliment there. And uh, I think my wife is, is fantastic at improv. I, I think she did uh, her uh, stuffy characters quite well during that uh, live stream last time. So I appreciate that. You know, yeah, it's a tough situation because, yeah, on the one hand, you want to be mindful of not being condescending and not being patronizing and it it is a little easy to just constantly slip into that default well they're just they just don't know any better they're too uh, you know if they were smarter then they would agree with me there's there's a conceit there that I think we need to guard against, you know, thinking like, well, if only people were smarter, they'd think like I do. Like that I feel like that's a conceit that is best avoided. That can lead to arrogance and uh, and but it's also dangerous because it underestimates the other side. Not everyone who is a conservative is only a conservative because they don't know any better. There are lots of people on the right who are extremely intelligent and know exactly what they're doing and are in many cases smarter than many of us and they just have different priorities and they value things differently and they honestly see no problem with devaluing certain groups of people and it's a lot scarier and a lot more disheartening to to say well, you know, an intelligent person can knowingly think that way and can knowingly advocate these kinds of inhumane policies. But I think it's dishonest and I think it's dangerous not to acknowledge that that is the case in many in the case of many people. Um, as to your father, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I'm very sympathetic to people who have to find room or have to find excuses to maintain relationships with family in a situation like that. I've said before, I've said a couple of times on this show and on podcast appearances and stuff that it was genuinely a great relief to me when I learned that my dad had not voted for Trump. I was not necessarily expecting him to, but I was aware that that was a possibility because my dad is a lot more conservative than I am. And, and my dad and I are, are very different in, in a lot of ways. And when I learned that he hadn't voted for Trump, I was genuinely relieved because I thought, oh, thank God, this now th this is something that I don't have to pretend I don't know, which is basically what I would have to do is, is I would have to I would have to pretend that I just don't know that. And that's what I do when I have to interact with other people who are in my family that I really have no choice but to see from time to time. And I don't want everything to be an argument. And I don't have the option to just say, I'm not going to see this person anymore for, for various reasons. So I just pretend I don't know that. And that sucks. That's, that's a horrible way to have to, you know, conduct your affairs. But sometimes that shitty choice seems like the least of all evils, uh, at least, you know, or the, 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 the best, of your shitty available choices. So I, I have great sympathy uh, for you in that, in, you know, having to, you know, deal with your, your father's vote. And I mean, I, I've been there myself, not specifically with my father, but with other people. And I, I have a great sympathy for that. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's probably, uh, we, we shouldn't fall too easily into the trap of just saying, well, you know, so-and-so only voted that way because uh, they don't know any better, e even if we're doing it to let them and us off the hook. Next question is from Ayame. Would you rather solve algebraic equations for 10 hours a day, five days a week until retirement age, or become a pro golfer? I'd pick the former no contest. Am I a good enough golfer to make a living as a pro? I mean, if within the context of your question... I'm a good enough golfer to make a living as a golfer, then I'll choose that. 
But if I'm just going to, if I'm going to have to play golf and I'm going to end up making a shitty living at it, then yeah, I think I'd rather do the algebra. I mean, I'm not great at algebra either. I'm really, it's, it's really, I'm not a big fan of either choice, but if I could make a lot of money doing the golf, then I would do the golf. If not, I guess I'd probably, I'd probably do the algebra. And then I would think, oh, this is what I'm going to use it for. Uh, next question is from Rocky Gregory. Do you think the further adventures of Pike and crew is a possibility? Cause I would watch the shit out of that. I have not heard anything about a series being in development. Like as far as I know, a series centered on Pike and, and the version of the enterprise introduced in discovery is not going to happen. But I think we'll probably see more of them in, in the future in the form of short treks. There have been a couple of the, of the new short treks released over the last few months that have featured uh, Anson Mount as Pike and uh, Ethan Peck as, as Spock and Rebecca Romaine as number one. And, and I, I've enjoyed them and it's been nice to see Pike and Spock in number one. And yeah, I would watch the shit out of that show too. I would, because I, I think Pike was one of the real highlights of season two of Discovery. And yeah, if they decided to do a, se a, a season, uh, a series of uh, Pike's Enterprise, I would love that because I love that version of the Enterprise. I love the aesthetic. I love the way that bridge looks. That bridge set of the Enterprise uh, from Discovery is one of my favorite sets I've ever seen on any Star Trek show. So just to get to look at that set, you know, 10, 12, 13 times a year, I would watch the show. To say nothing of how much I enjoy the actors and those particular versions of those characters, I would watch the shit out of it. Um, but other than reprising them here and there for stuff like short treks, uh, I, I don't think they're developing that into a series. I think right now they're 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 focusing on continuing discovery and uh, of course the Picard show, which comes out in less than a month, and then also after that, at some point on the horizon, is Michelle Yeoh's uh, Section Thirty One show. But beyond that, there's no other live action Trek in development. I don't think, at least in terms of TV. Um, so I, as far as I know, it's not happening right now. But maybe in the future it would. And yeah, I would totally watch it. Uh, Carlisle the Cinephile. Hello, Steve. I recently had two altercations with people who expressed bigoted beliefs. One was with a Facebook acquaintance who posted a transphobic meme on her wall, then got really defensive when I and others called her out about it. The second was with a co-worker who said some very racist things about the children who are being detained at the border. In both instances, I called them out for their behavior. In both instances, they later reached out to me and apologized to me for making me upset. In both cases, I told them that it isn't me they should be apologizing to and that if they truly want to make amends, they should reevaluate their beliefs and try to do better. And in both cases, my efforts were fruitless. Did I handle this okay? I appreciate that they both attempted to make amends with me, but their apologies came off as insincere to me. Neither person was sorry about their behavior, just that it made me upset. They felt like one of those, I'm sorry you felt that way type of apologies. And I just can't let stuff like this pass. I've done that for far too long, and now I see how that attitude can be unintentionally harmful. I see now that the term agree to disagree is meant for trivial disagreements, like what the best pizza topping is, or whether Kirk or Picard is the best captain. It isn't meant for serious issues that affect innocent people's lives. But I do recognize the effort they made, even if they missed the point. Should I have accepted their apologies? Well, to each their own, and it's not for me to tell you what you should or shouldn't have done. I can only tell you what I think I would have done based on the picture that you paint for me. And I probably would have done the exact same thing you did. Whether that is the right thing or the wrong thing, I don't know. But the way you handled it is probably the way that I would have handled it. I, I agree with you completely. I think that to apologize, it, look, yeah, it's a nice gesture to reach out and try to reconcile after an argument like that is a nice gesture. But if you are apologizing for making me upset and not apologizing for the atrocious things you said that made me upset, that's, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's, <laughs> That's a little bit like shooting someone in the leg and then saying, I'm really sorry that you lost all that blood. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> Thanks, I guess. I mean, you could be sorry for shooting me, which is what caused the blood loss. But okay, you're not sorry for that. You're just sorry that, you know, I, that, I, that I missed all the blood. So uh, it's like the emotional version of that. And I'm I'm 100% with you. I don't think that that's a genuine apology. And even if it, I mean, it's a genuine apology in the sense that they may genuinely be sorry, but they're sorry about the wrong thing. So I'm I'm with you. Uh, I, I I think it's it's worth it to acknowledge the effort and and to acknowledge that there was some form of contrition on their part. But if that contrition doesn't lead to change of the thing that was objectionable in the first place, then it's really kind of pointless. And the way you describe, the way you phrase it is, is just perfect. Agree to disagree is a wonderful attitude to have when the disagreement in question is over something trivial, not something important. If agreed to dis, if, if, if you think that Captain Kirk is the best captain and I think that Captain Picard is the best captain, we'll just agree to disagree. That's perfectly fair. That's reasonable, right? We shouldn't let that come between us. But yeah, if if you think that uh, detaining migrants at the border in concentration camps is acceptable, and I think it's you know uh, a, a violation of human rights and an atrocity that people should be sent to the Hague for, uh, that's not a trivial disagreement. And I I will I will not agree to disagree with you on that. And I think that's completely fair. I think that's completely fair. So no, I can't say whether it's right or wrong, but I can say I would have done it pretty much exactly the same as you did for whatever that's worth. Next question is from Dr. Babylon. I know not everyone draws this distinction, but I personally think there is a difference between pro-capitalist and pro-corporate. The 2009 bank bailouts were pro-corporate, but also a betrayal of free market principles, keeping afloat businesses which should have been allowed to drown. At the time, I was a libertarian Republican, and if I didn't believe in welfare for the poor, I certainly didn't believe in welfare for the rich. I said the bankers who wrecked our economy deserved to starve in the gutter. The 2008 crisis woke me up to how fragile our economic system is. And the 2009 bailouts woke me up to the fact that the rich are allowed to play by different rules. I gradually learned more and more examples of the government intervening in the economy on behalf of corporations, usually with the justification that giving money to businesses will help grow the economy or create new jobs, or that certain businesses are so important they can't be allowed to fail. The reason oil dominates the energy market isn't because it's cheaper to produce or more efficient, but because it is by far the most heavily subsidized of all energy sectors. The coal industry in America is on life support, and if it wasn't subsidized by the government, it would collapse entirely. Using the phrase free market to describe such a system is misleading. It annoyed me how many self-proclaimed libertarians were uninterested in combating cronyism, but gung-ho about dismantling welfare. I was also annoyed by the hypocrisy of the deficit hawks when it came to military spending. It took me a long time to get from despising crony capitalism to developing socialist sympathies. And even today, I'm not in favor of doing away with capitalism altogether. Thoughts? P.S. I'm not going to let you forget about if footmen tire you, nor should you, my friend. And I, even though the, the process is still stalled on the production of that video, I do appreciate the reminder. Um, yeah, I, you know, that, that notion of too big to fail is interesting to me because... I remember when that happened. I remember it's, I, I guess it's been 10 years. Uh, it was at the end of the previous decade when the bailouts uh, were made. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, if these banks are too big to fail, if the justification of, well, we have to bail them out because if we don't bail them out, then the consequences to the economy and the nation and the world will be worse than if we do. Like, I, I'm, I thought, and I still think, you know, I'm willing to give you this one. Like, if, if that is true, then the bailout is a good idea because if the bailout will prevent greater disaster and greater hardship being felt by people other than the bankers. And I agree with you, the banker, the bankers who caused it can starve in the gutter for all I care too. I'm hundred percent with you on that. Uh, but if, if bailing them out was necessary to, to, to prevent greater suffering from other people, then I did. Yes, absolutely. Let's do it. I'm hundred percent behind that. But after doing that, 
Should we not take a look at reforming our economy so that in the future we're not put in that situation again? And that's the thing that has bothered me the most about that issue in the last 10 years is that since the bailouts, instead of taking a look at that and going, you know, maybe we should change a few things so that we don't have companies like this that are too big to fail. So that if one of these organizations is, you know, going bankrupt, that we can just say, hey, sorry about your luck, <laughs> you know, and, and it will not threaten the entire economy of the world. And I don't really think we've done that. We're still in the same situation you know, where, where it could truly be said, well, we'd better, we, we have to stop, you know, this industry from failing because if it does, then it'll, it'll bring everything else down. And I mean, how would we change that? I'm not an economist. I have no idea, but, but I, I, I do think that it would have been, it was a great opportunity to reevaluate some things and to say, how can we change things? So that we don't have banks, for instance, that are too big to fail. And I'm, I'm completely with you on the coal industry, too. I, I have there is no to me, there is no legitimate reason why the coal industry should not be allowed to die. I mean, Trump props it up and uses it as an applause line because a lot of the people who come to his rallies are stuck in the 50s and they think that it would just be great if we were burning coal to make electricity for the next 200 years. Uh, they're completely misinformed, deluded people that, that Trump willing, you know, willfully lies to and strings along and makes empty promises to so that they'll continue to support him and his party. And uh, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm with you on a lot of that. And look, I, I don't favor completely doing away with capitalism either. I'm, I, I know that, that, that chafes my, my leftist friends in, in the chat. Um, but you know, I, I've also said that, that, that may in fact be due mostly to a, a lack of imagination or ambition or courage on my part. You know, it may be that I just am not able to envision a coherent picture of what it would be like post capitalism of any kind. Now, I, I obviously I think capitalism should be radically reformed, um, including getting rid of the idea of too big to fail. I feel like Nixon, I'm doing this a lot. It's too big to fail. Um, but yeah, so I think I, in, on this issue, I think we're, we're, we're more or less in the same boat, except I was never really a libertarian. Um, next question is from Riley Dosh. Why do you do it? I don't intend that in a mean way. I want to hear what about making videos and talking about Star Trek and other things do you love and what keeps bringing you back? Well, that's a good question. Uh, um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't take it in a mean way. Um, what keeps me coming back? What makes me do it? Uh, it's one of the only things I've ever felt like I'm really good at. So that helps. It's, it's so much better than having a real job. And it's such a, I, I, I will, I will use this word as an atheist. It's such a blessing, uh, to be able to do this as my job. Thanks to people watching the videos and, and thanks to especially my Patreon patrons who support the work I do and allow me to do this and to make a living doing this. Um, it's just, it's something I enjoy and it's something I'm, I feel like I'm pretty good at and that I can, I can chart progress. Like I can see that I've gotten better at it over the years. I can look at videos I did years ago and think I would do that better today, or the work that I'm doing today is better than that, either in terms of the writing or the editing or the choice of material or the perspective that I'm offering that is hopefully a little more informed and a little more um, enlightened than it was back then, and or my own performance on camera, you know, my own abilities as a presenter have improved, hopefully. So I, I like that. I like the fact that I can, that I, I'm good at it, and I feel like I can still get better at it. And that I haven't, I haven't hit a wall as far as that goes yet. Like I haven't gotten to a point where I've thought, oh, fuck, this is as good as I'm ever going to be. You know, this is, these videos are the best ones I'm ever going to be able to make. Like, I feel like I haven't hit that point yet. So that's fun. And that's, you know, energizing to think that I can keep doing it and keep innovating and, and improving. Um, so, and, and I just, I'm, I'm a, I'm an asshole with a big mouth and a lot of opinions. And there's very little else I have to offer the world. So there's that as well. But yeah, it's just, and it's fun. Like, it's fun. 
and it's it's so gratifying. It's gratifying to do. It's gratifying to have a finished script and to read over it and think this is actually pretty good. And then it's gratifying to perform it in front of the camera and to think this feels good. This feels like I'm doing a good job. And then to edit it and to and to have a finished video and think yeah, I think this is good. I think this is actually a good video. And then releasing it and having lovely people watch it and say uh, that they liked it. There's so many layers of, of gratification. It's so fulfilling to do. And that's why even in the darker moments of, of a few years ago when I was really being hit hard with harassment and people were like really just shitty, awful fucking, the worst people on YouTube were making videos about me and were attacking me and were attacking my wife and, and, and were just, just absolutely being vicious and awful and their vicious, awful followers were coming after me. I never for a second thought about not doing it. Like I never, ever, ever contemplated not doing, not making videos anymore. And it was because even then the good outweighed the bad, even then the opportunity to create and, and to do something that I felt like I was good at and that I was lucky enough to have found other people who appreciated it. Um, that, that was all that, that always outweighed the bad. So yeah, I don't know. I guess the simple answer is I just really, really dig it. <laughs> and I don't know what else, I don't know what the hell else I would be doing. <laughs> um, here's one from Isaiah Taylor. Cringiest Star Trek character. For me, Shay Astor's Isabella from the 1992 episode Imaginary Friend. When a nine-year-old girl's eyes turn red and become ho and becomes homicidal alien to a ship of 1,000 people, that's crazy. Certainly wouldn't go over well today in our SJW culture. Yes, I'm a liberal, not an SJW. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't borrow from Drew Barrymore's Poison Ivy. All in all, the episode also addressed loneliness and boredom. Steve, what are your thoughts? Um, well, uh, as far as that episode, I, I remember that episode being pretty good. Um, I'm not sure. Did Poison Ivy come out before or after that episode? I can't remember. Um... But yeah, I, uh, I I like that episode. As for cringiest character, I don't know if I would say that Isabella is the cringiest character. I mean, look, for me personally, I know this is an unpopular choice with a lot of people. My cringiest Star Trek character is always going to be Loxana Troy. I just, I, I to me, that, that character is like nails on a chalkboard. I just... I do not enjoy Lawaxana. I know a lot of people do, and more power to you. I'm not. I'm not going to shit on Lawaxana because I know a lot of people really, really love her, and that's great. If you love Lawaxana, go for it. Love Lawaxana with my. You know, you'll get no trouble from me. But me personally, I. Yeah, I would say Lawaxana is my cringiest character of uh, of the ones I can think of off the top of my head. There might be like a one-off character I can't remember at the moment that is worse, um, but. Uh, yeah, I would say Loxana. Uh, the Republican Party is a Nazi party. Is TNG a centrist liberal sci-fi fantasy? Is DS9 Antifa? Ooh, provocative. Um, I think TNG probably has more centrist tendencies than progressive or leftist tendencies. I mean, there. well, I would say Star Trek in general, I would say, is progressive. Star Trek overall, I think, is progressive, but there is definitely a streak of centrism in Star Trek that you can't really get away from. I think DS9 probably had less of it than the other shows, but I think there has always been a streak of, of centrism, often disguised as pragmatism, you know, often disguised as, well, you know, we have to see both sides, like that kind of thing, which is not always a valid position in every situation. There are obviously there are issues where yes, it is important to look at both sides, where there are tons of gray areas. Uh but not always. Sometimes it's best to pick a side. Sometimes one side is obviously on the right side. Uh but yeah, I and you know, Deep Space 9 indulged in those gray areas. Uh and and treated them as such. Like I don't Deep Space 9 didn't usually didn't usually ha come from a position of, well, you know, actually both sides have really good points so much as it came from a position of this is a really, really difficult issue and it's not sure who, and it's not immediately clear who is right and who is wrong. And everybody's probably a little bit of both. Like that's a little bit more where Deep Space Nine would come in. So is Deep Space Nine, anti I mean, I think Deep Space Nine is Antifa in the sense that the good guys were literally anti-fascists. 
I mean, the, the primary villains of Deep Space Nine turn out to be uh, the Cardassians and then later the Founders, uh, who sort of absorb Cardassia for the latter half of the series. And, and I, I think you could make a very good argument that that is a fascist regime. And so, yes, the heroes of Deep Space Nine are literally Antifa. <laughs> so, yes, in that sense, they are. I think in general, in general, Star Trek is, is fairly anti-fascist. Um, but is it is it is it leftist? Is it is it always like super progressive? Uh, not necessarily. It does have a streak of centrism in it uh, from time to time. Uh, Matthew Rick, it is unfortunate that Jason lost the audio for your Star Wars holiday special riff. Any especially good zingers we are missing out on? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and you know, yeah, it was it was. Uh, I'm sure it was no fault of Jason's. He uh, he accidentally lost his half of our. Uh, what was going to be our Christmas special, our, our, our commentary track for the Star Wars holiday special, which is a bummer because we had a, but you know, as he said in, in his uh, announcement uh, explaining to everybody what had happened, we, he and I got to watch the holiday special together and it was a lot of fun. So from my perspective, I'm not really, I'm, I'm disappointed that everybody else won't get to hear it because I did think it was a good show, but yeah, me and Jason got to watch the holiday special together and hang out and have a good time. So I'm not, that upset about it from a personal level, right? It's, and, and obviously it wasn't his fault and we've lost shows because I've done shit like that before too. <laughs> so like, it's not, no, you know, I'm not remotely upset at Jason about it or anything, but uh, yeah, I, I, I may, I know I made at least one mod joke and at least one golden girls joke when, uh, when B Arthur was on screen. So you missed out on that. Uh, what else? I mean, there were tons of good Wookiee jokes, obviously. Uh, we had a, uh, we had, I think we, we both contributed. We had a, a funny sort of running gag about Art Carney's character secretly having an affair with Chewbacca's wife. And that's why he was always coming over to their house and was on such good terms with the family. Uh, obviously, uh, Chewie's dad watching that, uh, Diane Carroll music video. We made lots of jokes about how that was a porno tape. Uh, so I mean, yeah, there was stuff that you missed that I wish people had gotten to see, but you know, shit happens. And, uh, yeah, you know, at least this one wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, next question is from John Burns Burnsy. Hi, Steve. I know you probably don't listen to, didn't listen to the Queen's Christmas broadcast. I was wondering if the United States president would have to once or twice a year have to meet with another leader and show that person fealty and respect, it would be a benefit to the United States. Would it help the American political parties to understand that there's more than simply their party's POV that matters, or would the monarch become politicized? I understand there's lots of issues with capitalism, I'm not blind, but the whole idea of a group of leaders who are outside the parliamentary battle over the soul of the American people might be a benefit for those living outside both groups. Oh, and if you haven't seen the broadcast, I'd like you to see it and give me your thoughts. I know the royal family are not perfect, and at least one might be a right royal bastard, but the queen has always impressed me. This is her job for life, and people do not just show her respect because of her position— but because of who she is. And I did uh, watch the, the, and there's a link there to the Queen's broadcast, and I did watch it. And um, I thought it was, I thought it was, I thought it was good. I, I, I of course, appreciated the, uh, um, the Apollo 11 reference. You know, I, I, that, that was right up my alley. Um, and it, it, I thought it was a well-written piece of rhetoric and, you know, the, the, uh, the theme of reconciliation is, is a good one and reconciliation is, is, is a wonderful thing if it is called for <laughs> and we can, you know, depending on the situation, it may be called for it. It may not be. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I thought it was a good message and I'm not a monarchist. I, I don't think that the monarchy should be there, but I am, I'm glad that in Great Britain, the monarchy is basically ceremonial at this point. You know, the monarch doesn't really have any political power, which I think is, is good. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you're going to keep a queen or a king around, at least keep them, keep them as a ceremonial figurehead and don't, uh, you know, don't give them any political power. That's a good way to handle it. If, if you see some reason to, to have a monarchy in the first place, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's all fine. The queen seems like a good a good person, from what I can tell. As as good as you can be, 
in that position from a uh, you know a royal family like that. Uh, she's probably best case scenario for that sort of thing. And yeah, the idea of of a head of, of heads of state you know welcoming people from other countries and we do that in the United States. Heads of state from other countries come here all the time and are and are greeted at the White House and given warm receptions. But people don't really pay attention to it. It's because it happens so often. And uh, yeah, I think in general, America would benefit from a broadening of our horizon just overall, whether it's in the form of interacting with, with other world leaders or, or, or people of other countries or whatever form it would take. I feel like we have such narrow vision, and I mean just collectively as a country, lots of us see beyond this, but collectively as a country, we have such narrow vision where it's like the world stops outside of our borders. And that's a really dangerous attitude to have. And it reinforces a lot of the problems that we have here in the United States that other countries are at least a little further along in solving than us, like, uh, like gender and racial inequality, like gun violence, like economic inequality, like environmental problems. Like th These are problems everywhere, but there are many countries that are economically or industrially comparable to the United States that are a lot further along in addressing these issues than we are. And one of the one of the obstacles to addressing those problems more robustly here in the United States is that there's this, um, not just an America first, but an America only mentality that encourages many of us to just outright ignore what is happening in other parts of the world. Um, and that's, that, that's a real obstacle to change. So I think it would benefit us greatly and I imagine it would benefit, you know, other countries as well. Next question is from our old pal, some random geek. Steve, how many people do you know that have to beg online in order to just buy food, pay for rent, or any number of things, including avoiding going into the red in their checking accounts? If I was asked that, if I was asked that three years ago, I would say zero. I may have heard about some people my parents know but it would have been no one I knew. Fast forward to today, as I am now an anarcho-syndicalist, Kevin Logan has taken to Facebook, hating to do so, to ask for donations for his PayPal. Kevin Logan's PayPal is here, by the way, and I put Kevin's PayPal in the description of this video as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our friend Leto Anor is in a situation where she will need to set up a GoFundMe campaign soon to help pay for things. She has a lot of vet bills for her cat of 17 years, Merlin, who just passed away. And again, as you saw, if you were watching at the beginning of the stream, I added Leto's PayPal information to the description as well, so you can go... Uh, uh, help Leto out as well. For me, that makes it four people who I know that are begging online for donations. Joanna requires donations from strangers, family, and friends for the past two and a half years that I have known her. The measly $1,300 she gets per month doesn't cover all her expenses for her and her kid. She eats one meal a day to get by. This is why I'm happy to have given her over $26,000 over the time I have known her and will continue to give her money. And there is Phoenix, who has been struggling to find a steady source of income for over the past 15 months. I've given her quite a bit of money too, and there are and there are gifts, not loans. They don't have to pay me back. And there are some friends uh, who have been or are in that situation, like Foxy Jazabel, Makaya B, and Christy Abbey, and then the H Bomber Guy fan Discord server. There have been 10 people just in the past month that have put their PayPal links in the Signal Boost server. This is why I am thinking about getting a second job. This is why I ask, what are ways to earn extra cash? Since I'm able-bodied, I might as well work hard and earn money for those who have difficulty doing so. But I'm also wondering, do I know more people that have to e-beg just, just to eat because I became a leftist and anarcho-syndicalist? Or is it because the whole system is failing far more people now than ever in recent memory? The Trump administration is threatening to cut food stamps just because school lunch debt is a thing. And yet, I'm the problem because I say violent revolution may be necessary. And when I get shit, shit post, and I get shit, shit posting a joke meme saying kill all landlords, well, excuse me for doubting billionaires being willing to give up their billions. Some billionaires would rather vote for Trump instead of Warren just because of her small, modest wealth tax that pales compared to Sanders' plan, rant over. P.S. Hagati in honor of Leto Anner's fluffy furry friend Merlin, who is no longer with us. And you may consider Adi hugged in Merlin's honor. If she were in here with me right now, I would snatch her up and hug her right now. But I think she's in the living room, probably taking a nap on the couch. And I do not wish to disturb her. Uh, yeah, I, 
I think it's it's not just because you're a leftist. Uh, it's a general thing. I, there are, I mean, it's it's partially because the internet allows people to seek help more easily, which which is a good thing. But yeah, I, I think there are a lot of people who are just in trouble, and here in the United States and and in and, and other parts of the world as well. Oh, you know, there's uh, um, people who are harmed by uh, austerity in the UK. Uh, and the same as, as, as they are harmed by cuts to public benefits here in the United States. The Trump administration is exacerbating the problem by hacking away at public benefits. And I saw a headline just a couple of days ago that Trump said he would love, if, if he gets reelected, he would love to make gutting Medicare a project. Like, just think about the mentality. Think about how, how shitty of a human being you have to be to actually look forward to cutting funding for a necessary program that allows people to access medical care that they need to 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 live in health and in some cases to live at all right to 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 really rub your hands and go oh if i get into a second term and i don't have to worry about getting re-election i'm really going to go after medicare like what 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 the fuck like, how broken of a human being do you have to be to take such relish in the prospect of fucking over poor people even more than they are already being fucked over now? So that's a big part of it. But in general, it's 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 not just that you're... I don't think it's just that you, you happen to be a leftist and you know a lot of people. I think everybody knows people that are in that situation. Um, and it sucks. And yeah, as, as I'll mention it this time and I'll mention it Again, at the end, the the links to uh, donate to some of the people that some random geek mentioned in the question and, and that we've talked about throughout the show are in the description of this video. Help them out if you possibly can. Uh, here's the next question from Jin. Hi, Steve Shives. What do you think is the best Trek episode that could be adapted into a conventional Oscar bait non-sci-fi movie? Ooh. Uh, non-sci-fi so that leaves out the visitor my favorite episode because it's it's hard to do the visitor without the sci-fi conceit isn't it um uh family maybe you could repurpose family so that the the trauma that the lead character is recovering from is not a a borg abduction but some other kind of trauma maybe they're 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 a survivor of a war or a genocide or or some kind of uh, traumatic abduction of some other kind and they've returned home to sort of process the trauma like you could do that you can just you know take out the borg stuff and you could still have the captain picard character coming home uh and it, hey if you made it a holocaust drama there's oscar bait right there because the oscars love holocaust movies um that's 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 probably the best one i can think of or you know I, hey you want to do an I, i'm thinking of star trek movies that could or star trek episodes that could be adapted into holocaust movies duet from deep space nine um, might be sort of sci-fi-ish, depending on how you handle the 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 Cardassian taking another Cardassian's identity, how you explain that. But I think you could probably de-sci-fi that and play that as a straight story. And I mean, duet is a great episode and a really great idea for an episode. So that's that's another one there that I might uh, propose as well. Um, anything with the Holocaust in it is Oscar bait. So Joe McClory says, so I got myself roped into a political conversation at a holiday get together. And it made me realize what I actually hate about criticisms from conservative minded people. Not that it is all wrong, but that it is so shallow. For example, media bias and fake news. I agree there are problems with the news framing poorly sourced and incomplete stories as if they were settled fact and focusing on ratings instead of interesting stories instead of important ones. I think these are good and interesting discussions to have, but every time I try to talk about them, it quickly becomes clear that they think that fake news is news that is unflattering to Trump, and the only problem with media bias is that it targets conservatives. It is very frustrating because it is so hard to point out that they are right when they see problems that exist, but are not willing to see that their solutions to those problems will only make things worse. This kind of feels like venting instead of a question, but I'm wondering if you agree and if you have any interesting insights about arguing politics or trying to inform the probably willfully less informed about politics. Uh, it's, it's always a challenge to try to inform people who won't be informed. 
you can try to correct things that people have wrong factually, but if they're that invested in the position that they've taken, they'll probably just shrug it right off. You know, if you if you point out to a Trump supporter how often Trump lies, like if you say, you know, take politics completely out of it. Why would you want to support a president or any political leader or, or any person for that matter who lies as often, as habitually, as outrageously as Donald Trump lies on a daily basis. And people might say, oh, all politicians lie, but it's provable that Trump is at a whole nother level. Like Trump's flagrant, shameless, demonstrable dishonesty is something that has never been seen at that level of politics in this country before. Ever, ever. It's there there is there there is no corresponding case in history of a president that has been that openly brazenly dishonest and so consistently like since he started running for the office and straight through to today. So if someone is willing to overlook that, it's hard to see where you're going to persuade them that well you you know that actually that opinion is based on a misunderstanding or that opinion is based on something that's not really factual. If they're not interested in facts to begin with, how do you argue the facts? So sadly, I don't really have any insight on that. I do think part of the problem is uh, in the way that modern news media, particularly on television and particularly on cable, things with, with channels like Fox News for the most part, but really MSNBC and CNN have been guilty of this as well. Uh, of framing everything as a side A versus side B conflict and both sides have equally valid positions that we need to listen to. Like I saw a, a tweet a couple days ago that I retweeted that I thought was just, just terrific um, that put it like this. They said, uh, if, if you're a journalist and if you're a journalist and uh, someone says it's raining and someone says it's sunny outside, it's not your job to quote them both. It's your job to look out the window and find out what the fuck is true. And I feel like we've missed a lot of that. We've, we've forgotten that, you know, we're supposed to care about what's true. We're not supposed to listen to one side and then the other and then just pick our favorite or pick the one that is the most comforting for us. If there are facts in dispute, we need to settle what those facts are and then base our opinions or our positions on a given issue on those facts, not on what we wish was true or what we think ought to be true. I think we've lost a lot of that and that makes it very difficult to argue constructively with people who have staked out these reactionary positions to things. Um, Tom McDonald. Hey, Steve, Mary, four days after the winter solstice. What did you do for Christmas, Yule, whatever? And what was your haul of gifts? Hope you made out like a bandit. Well, uh, I, I got a lot of gift cards, which is nice. It's the next best thing to cash. And uh, of course, I posted on social media about this already, but just in case anybody missed my absolutely favorite Christmas gift that I got this year courtesy of, of my, my lovely and considerate and thoughtful wife. Uh, this is the, the, this is the gift that I got that is absolutely my favorite. And there you can, I'll try to angle it. So the reflection isn't, <laughs> isn't obscuring it, but yeah, it is a, it is a portrait, a framed photograph of none other than, uh, commander Riker, the great Jonathan Frakes. Uh, there you can kind of see there. See, I think, I, I, I think we could be, we could be related honestly. But yeah, uh, Ashley got me this and it was the sweetest. Oh, that's a good angle. You can actually see. Uh, Ashley got me this and it's, it's a real, it's like a vintage frame from the 1970s. It's like a really fancy, cool frame. And then in it is this, this beautiful picture of, uh, of Jonathan Frakes uh, as Commander Riker. So that, believe it or not, that's how big of a Star Trek geek I am. That's how big of a, of a number one fan I am, of a, of a, of a Riker fan I am. That this, uh, when I opened up this present, I, I giggled. I, 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 I exclaimed with glee. It was, <laughs> it was really easily the, the best thing I got this Christmas. And, and it sits up on my desk, so he is always looking down on me. So yeah, that's, uh, I, yes, I made out like a bandit. Yes. 
And final question from Matthew Datcher. Steve, what traditions do you and your wife have for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day? Well, we don't really, I mean, we usually, uh, we'll usually have like a, you know, a, a, a glass of sparkling wine or sparkling cider together uh, and count down to midnight. We'll watch the, the New Year, the, uh, the, uh, the Times Square uh, ball drop on TV and count down to midnight and share a New Year's kiss and, you know, have champagne or sparkling cider or whatever. Um, you know, and we've, we've gone to New Year's Eve parties once or twice over the years. Like we, we, uh, went, I think we went to a New Year's party several years ago when we were working with, uh, uh, Neon Real Entertainment, the independent film company that I used to write for and that, that Ashley did some, uh, acting and writing and producing for, uh, so we've uh, we've we've done that before, but I, you know I'm I've said before my ideal New Year's Eve is to go to bed at 10 a.m. and wake up the next morning. Um, but failing that, spending the evening together with my wife and watching the ball drop and you know sharing a toast that's that's about as as much of a New Year's tradition as we have, and that's really the only New Year's tradition I feel like I need. Um, I I enjoy that, so that's that's basically all we do. And New Year's Day. Uh, not really. Sometimes we go out and, and, you know, go out shopping or go out to eat or something, but it's not like a hard, fast tradition. Like this is what we do on New Year's. So, uh, yeah. Aren't you glad you asked? Aren't you glad you got that question in <laughs> with minutes to spare before the show started? <laughs> All right. So let's turn now to the live chat. And uh, if any, oh, I saw there's a, a super chat that I just saw from John Burns, of course. And of course, it's about Loaxana. Loaxana deserves our respect. The biggest influence on Star Trek episodes, uh, Majel Barrett Roddenberry, bow down to the daughter of the fifth house, holder of the sacred chalice of Reeks, heir to the holy rings of Beta Z. Fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, thank you very much for the super chat, my friend. So, um, Yes, Matthew points out, uh, Riker looks down on me and Kirk screams at me. Yes, because uh, for anybody who doesn't know what that is in reference to, this is also, again, another another gift from, from my lovely wife. Um, this is on, on, my, uh, on my desk as well, right, right above the webcam, actually, is where I usually keep it. So uh, there we go. Yes, Kirk screams at me, and Riker is looking down at me. Uh, yes, Leto, Riker is a fuckboy. Okay, fine. <sighs> I'm just lost. I get lost in his eyes. What can I say? Uh, all right, questions from the live chat, now that I'm done being distracted. Um, a secular scholar says, any an idea that I have to help with gun violence that sidesteps the Second Amendment, restrict ammo sales to two boxes, 50 rounds a box, and prohibit calibers to problem guns. What do you think? I think it's better than what we have now. I would certainly be willing to try it. I think it's, yeah, I think it's it's, it's preferable to the minimal measures that we have in most places now. Um, a trance, how are you with hangovers these days? I have not had a hangover for many, many years because I almost never drink alcohol. So I'm pretty good with hangovers. Um... 255 AD, question, Stuffy threatened to throw a person out of the husky shelter as soon as they misbehaved. Isn't that kind of callous? I mean, living on the streets can fuck you up. Well, but I think in the case of Joff, because Joff had a well-established history that was known to Stuffy, I think that was a special case. I think Stuffy would be very tolerant of a person that had just come to the shelter for help that he didn't know and didn't have any reason to suspect would be a problem person. But with Joff, he knew that Joff has this history and he was basically giving Joff one more chance. And he didn't, th even then he didn't throw Joff out on the street. He gave Joff some money and gave him the opportunity to go to another shelter, you know, so stuff, he didn't just throw Joff completely out on the street. I agree with you. It's a very callous thing. And I don't think stuff, would just throw him out on the street. Uh, he tried to provide for him a little bit and then basically said, look, you can't. He gave him the opportunity to make amends and stay, first of all. But then he said, if you if you refuse to do what we need you to do to reassure us that you won't be a problem person here um, and you won't harm the other people here, then you have to go. But here's some money and here's another place you can go to stay. So Stubby didn't kick him out on the street. But the reason he was willing to ask him to leave the shelter was because of that history. Um <laughs> 
Uh, Seal0626, ever watched Red Dwarf, sci-fi sitcom with TNG in my childhood TV once they solved JFK's death? I've never actually seen it. I have. I know a couple other people who are huge Red Dwarf fans, and I've just never watched it. I, I should get around to watching it at some point. Uh, Nathaniel Robinson, now that you have finished with DS9's Good Nazis, is redemption a religious concept? Good for sci-fi? What's wrong with a well-developed, unredeemable character? Absolutely nothing. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a well-developed, unredeemable character. I actually think, I feel quite strongly that some villains should not be redeemed. Not because I want to send the message that redemption is completely worthless or impossible, but because I want to send the message that in reality, not everybody is redeemed or redeemable or interested in redemption. That was part of the point of Joff's story arc in this season of Stephen Stuffy. Um, I made it, uh, I made a point of having Joff go through a version of A Christmas Carol, probably the best known redemption story in English literature, uh, at least from the last couple hundred years. And he ends it by not getting redeemed. That was, that was a very intentional choice to have Joff not be redeemed because I feel like it's important to put that out there. It's important to have villainous characters who are not redeemable and are not redeemed. So I, I agree with you 100%. Not every villain should be redeemed. Um, Don, uh, Don WS4E, Deadpool 3 is coming out. Do we really need another Deadpool? No. Uh, we don't. Uh, some random geek says, is it okay for leftists to use slurs? Some leftists defend their use of slurs. Thoughts? I, I don't think it's okay for anybody to use slurs. Isn't that what makes it a slur? That it's not okay to say? I don't think, yeah, I, no. No, I don't, I, 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 I do not go along with that. Um... 255 AD, a couple years ago, Thunderfoot claimed you reported him for harassment because he supported him on Patreon. What's your side of that? I don't remember ever reporting Thunderfoot for anything. Maybe you're thinking of someone else. I think I've I've reported I reported a couple of Patreon campaigns for because they were run by abusive, bigoted assholes. Uh, I don't think I ever reported Thunderfoot. I mean, it's easy to imagine why I would have, though, because he was a piece of shit. Um, Pedro Nagara, who else would be a great number one? Right here. Me. I would be a great number one. Uh, uh, Gully Foil, how, have you ever done stand-up? No, I have not. I've never done stand-up. I don't know if I'd be good at it. Uh, don't you have to be funny? Um... Don WS4E prediction, how good will Picard be on a scale of one to 10? I'm going to be conservative and, and say, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say it'll be a solid seven. Hopefully it'll be a lot better. Hopefully it'll be a 10, but I'm going to hedge my bet and say, let's go for a seven. I think a seven is attainable. Uh, Paludrium ever read or listened to Noam Chomsky a little bit, not extensively. Um, Here's another one from 255 AD. Uh, DS9 is less centrist than other Star Trek. Don't you think some of the maybe capitalism is good Ferengi stories were flirting with 90s neoliberal pop propaganda? Um, maybe a little, but you know, most of the Ferengi stories were were about satirizing capitalism. There, there were some parts of Ferengi culture that were sort of presented as maybe good in a certain way or redeemable, but the overarching story of the Ferengi in Deep Space Nine is of Quark and Rom gradually discovering all of the things that are wrong with the way they were brought up and their hyper focus on profit. You know, Rom doesn't wind up really caring about profit at all, and, and, and Quark has to sort of admit that there are more important things in life. So I, I feel like it's more of a critique of capitalism and of, of devotion, like single-minded devotion to the profit motive than it is, you know, saying certain parts of this are good. So, I mean, I mean, maybe you're right, but overall, I don't think the message is, is maybe capitalism is good. Um, Gabriel Alexander. Hi, Steve is a big fan of the Ensign's log. How much of Ensign Riker's personality is like your actual personality and how much is just made up to be funny? A lot of his personality is my personality, but there are certain things that are just the character. Like Riker is a ladies man and I am definitely not. <laughs> um, and Riker, R Riker and, and Barkley's dynamic on the show, like their camaraderie 
and their chemistry together is very much Jason and I's natural chemistry together. But Jason, Jason's character being sort of the the reluctant kind of uh, pessimistic person, and and my character being the the reckless, outgoing, let's just do it kind of person like that. That's not really my personality. I'm not a pessimist. I'm very, I'm naturally very optimistic, but I am also not nearly as extroverted and gung ho as as uh, as Riker is on the show. Um, uh, Pedro Nagara, DS9 is awesome, but why does it look so terrible? I'm like, uh, like in terms of the video quality, it's because it, it's never been upscaled. It's, it's never been upscaled to HD. Uh, that's why it looks shitty compared to TOS and, uh, and TNG because they, they, they've both been released in high def and DS9 has not. Uh... A, a trance. What would life be like for Gold Ducat in the fire caves? It would. I, it would be hot. I would think, wouldn't it? It would be pretty hot. I hope he has like a vent or something. Uh, Wolfwood four thirty eight. Do you think Garrick or any other DS nine character will appear on Picard? I wouldn't expect to see Garrick. Maybe somebody. I mean, Worf might show up. He is a DS nine character as well as a TNG character. I wouldn't look for too many DS nine cameos though. Um, 255 AD, dad supported my joining the labor party because he respects my views even if he doesn't agree. I don't know how to feel about that because I don't respect his views in that way. Well, that's perfectly fair though. Like you do, you shouldn't feel obligated. If there are things about his particular views that you can't respect, that's fine. You don't owe him that respect. Just If, if he is capable of respecting your views, great. If you are not capable of respecting his because those particular views are just not morally acceptable to you, that's completely fine. Like you don't owe, it's not a quid pro quo. You don't owe him acceptance of his beliefs just because he can accept yours. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Um, oh, Leto Anner says amendment to the no slur rule, slow reappropriation. Yes, I would. Yeah, obviously if I were, if I were a member of a disadvantaged group, I, you know, and, and, people in my group had reappropriated a slur like that's yeah I'm, it's not for me to say you can't do that absolutely that's that's a great that's a great amendment um uh sean hartley hey steve hope you're well favorite episode of enterprise i think i've answered this before i can't remember the title but it's from the first season it's the one where i think they're examining a comet or something and also there's the scene where they're answering questions from the elementary school class from back on earth and Commander Tucker's like, a poop question, sir? Like, I like that episode. Um, Robert Mills, will you and Barkley get promotions? Probably not. We'd have to change the title. I think we'll, we'll probably remain ensigns. Um, we certainly haven't, we certainly haven't uh, discussed getting promotions. And Marty Aberdeen, I think, makes a similar point to what Leto said, uh, saying, uh, I do think it's context. I can use the T word and black people can use the N word context most certainly matters yeah i would agree i would agree with that I, I, similar to what i said about uh, leto proposing an, an exception yeah that's that i i agree um nathaniel robinson opinion on the rose tico controversy i think rose should have been in the movie more i agree i hashtag rose deserved better i i mentioned that in i i made a joke about it but i i mean it's very it, it's sincerely my my uh, opinion in my in my review of the Force or the Force Awakens in my review of the Rise of Skywalker, where I, I mentioned Rose as uh, a role that was a cameo that should have been a more robust supporting role. Um, yeah, I I completely think that that she was poorly served and that she should have been in the movie more. Here's a super chat from Andrew Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, lovely swearing man. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for magnificent homages to the Trek alumni we lost this year. Really tugged at the heartstrings. Well, I appreciate being able to do that. I'm glad that people responded uh, positively to them. I mean, it's, it's really a bummer having to do it because uh, people have died, but those videos are really satisfying to write. I mean, it's a good, it's the worst possible excuse, but it's a good excuse to look back at particular episodes or at particular actors and their performances and their contributions and to really celebrate their work. Um, it's a sad reason to do a good thing, you know, so I'm glad people have liked those videos. Uh, Secular Scholar, what do you think about also rants like GoBots, Silverhawks, and Street Sharks? I never watched Silverhawks and Street Sharks, but I used to watch GoBots when I was a kid all the time. 
I even had some of the toys. I had Leader One and Scooter or Scootor, whatever the fuck he was called. Maybe it was just Scooter. I don't know. But yeah, I had some GoBots toys. Uh, they were crap. They were not nearly as 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 durable or as fun as as Transformers, and the show wasn't nearly as good as Transformers. But uh, yeah, I I don't have any particular animus toward GoBots. I kind of have fond childhood memories of it. Uh, but yeah, it was it was not as as memorable as Transformers, and like I didn't I never saw the other two. Um, a trance could changelings be assimilated by the Borg? What would a shape shifting drone be like? I, I would guess they probably could be assimilated because they established in First Contact and Voyager that the Borg use, uh, they, they use uh, nanoprobes. So the Borg nanoprobes, I would assume, could infiltrate the body of a changeling just the same as it could the body of a solid. So I, I would guess a changeling could be assimilated. I don't know. I don't, it's, never, it's never been shown, but I would, I would imagine. Um <laughs> Uh, Johnny McSee Biscuit. Also, I've always been a fan of Janeway and I love Star Trek Discovery. Now, please feed me to the lions. Not here, my friend. Not here. I, um, I mean, I've, like, I've, I've made videos making fun of Captain Janeway and I, I, I'm not like a, I, I don't think that character was particularly well written, but I'm not going to attack you for it. And I'm certainly not going to give you any shit for liking Discovery because I love Discovery too. So you will not be fed to the lions here. Um, Oh, and A-Trance, also a Jem Hadar drone. Now, that would be interesting. Um, final checkmate. I demand Stuffy and the rest of those toy characters have a crossover with the Chucky doll. Demand. Well, somebody's going to have to clear the rights or pay me a lot of money. Um... Two fifty five AD question: Do Steve and Stuffy and the Whirlpool take place in the same universe? Yes, they do. Um, <laughs> comrade Ibot, hiya, Comrade Shives, fuck Mary, kill Moa, Marx, Lennon. Um, I don't know who Moa is, so I can't play this game. Um, Somebody tell me who Moa is. And I'll, uh, no, it doesn't matter. If I don't know who it is, I can't decide whether I would fuck Mary or kill them. Um, uh, Wolfwood438. Hey, Steve, I was wondering, what would you say is your favorite Star Trek moment across all the franchise? Ooh, damn. Uh, it's hard to pick just one. I love I love Cisco hugging Jake at the end of, of The Visitor and Jake saying, are you all right? And Cisco saying, I am now, Jake. I am now. Uh, that's just, oh, God, that's just a beautiful moment. Uh, on the opposite side of that, not a feel-good moment at all, but a fantastic dramatic moment and a really important moment for the character and, and that sets the character off on his arc for that movie uh, in Star Trek VI when Spock says to Captain Kirk about the Klingons, Jim, they are dying. And Kirk immediately responds with, let them die. I love that moment. It gives me chills. Um, yeah, that, those two probably have to fight it out. Or or maybe like when, when Kirk comes back to life at the end of a mock time and Spock sees him for the first time and kind of loses it and goes, Jim! And then immediately goes back to being cold, emotionless Spock. That's a great moment too. Um, it's hard to pick just one. Uh, Lex Hart, here's a wild card question. Do you think Stargate was murdered early? I mean, it got it got like eight seasons, didn't it? It's hard to say a show that ran for eight seasons got murdered early. But then again, but I, I I actually have never watched Stargate, so maybe maybe I would feel the same way. Um, Johnny McSeebus, could Steve now be honest? Is it possible that so many people dislike Voyager and Discovery because it is driven by female characters? Sometimes it's what it feels like, sadly. I think that's exactly the reason why a lot of people don't like, especially Discovery. Voyager, uh, yeah, I think, that, I mean, there were people, I remember, I remember when Voyager started before, similar to the reaction to Discovery and to the new Star Wars movies, there were people who were angry about Voyager before the first episode had even aired because of a woman being the captain and also because of Tuva being a, a a Vulcan played by an African American actor, so yeah, I think that's that's certainly a big part of the of of, of the very angry rejection of the shows. Like there are people who don't like both shows for reasonable reasons, 
or because it's just not their cup of tea for whatever. But, but in terms of like the really angry reactionary stuff, that's like, Oh, I fucking hate that show. But I think a lot of it is, is, is sexism. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. Um, Uh, some random geek says question. Why do people hate to ask for help from their friends or family? Um, like with Kevin Logan hating to ask his friend. Well, because it's embarrassing. It's, you know, I, 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 I can, I can relate to that. I think it's embarrassing. Uh, it maybe it shouldn't be, you know, I can understand people, you know, you, you should feel at Liberty if you need help. Right. You know, uh, but yeah, it's embarrassing. Uh, Tom McDonald, super chat. Thank you, my friend. Hey, I got super chat to work for the first time. Good for me. <laughs> yeah. No more excuses, Tom. You got it to work. I don't want, I don't just want patron money. I want super chat money from you now too. No, I'm kidding. I'm of course I'm kidding. Uh, Mao. Oh, Mao. Did it? So, so, okay. Yeah. Someone said it was spelled Moa. Mao, I know who Mao is. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Mao Zedong, yeah. Um, apologies. I will I will turn my brain on. So, okay, fuck, Mary kill, Mao, Marx, Lenin. Uh, I mean, Mao killed a lot of people, so I'd probably kill Mao. Um, fuck, Lenin, Mary, Marx. There you go. Um Andrew Michael, okay, I just like this comment. I like seeing you hold up your picture of Riker. That smug, self-satisfied, bearded git holding a picture of Commander Riker. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, Shirley Singleton, do I need to listen to all of the previous episodes of Steve and Stuffy, or can I just jump in? Um, I would recommend at least going back to the beginning of the season. If you like, if you want to jump in at the beginning of the most recent season, you could probably follow it. Uh, but if you really want to jump in and, and know where everything is going, I would say go back at least to the start of season four or five and, and, and watch from that point forward. It's not necessary. Like you'll still enjoy the show. You'll still get people's personalities and hopefully it'll still be enjoyable and funny to you. It's not like totally inaccessible, but I think you'll enjoy it more if you go back and start a little earlier. So, yeah, if that makes sense. Um, Two fifty five AD. Dad likes a lot of so of soch dem ideas, but votes Tory because he likes law and order and borders more. Can we reach such people? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been it's happened before. I, I'm not the person to necessarily ask about the best way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it is time for me to watch stargate you're right uh oh matthew i love your new year's day tradition new year's day tradition is to spend the day at the udvar hazy center of the air and space museum oh ho, 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 ho. that sounds so fun i'm probably not going to join you but that sounds so fun. Uh, a secular scholar says, I never hated either because of the sexism, but because of the Kazon and threshold. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Um, Oh, 255 AD uh, sh says, should non-neurotypical people such as myself get to say the R word? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think it's a slur. I think it should fall, it should be treated like other slurs. Uh, and here's a, another super chat from John Burns. Thank you very much. Uh, I was thinking that the Cardassians might be like the conquistadors in Latin America as opposed to Nazis, which allows for an invasion link. Yes, they expanded to Poland, but not like Spain, Damar. Good? Uh, yeah, if, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, the, the reason why I say that the Cardassians are Nazis 
is not not necessarily because the Nazis and, and the form of the Nazi government is the best match for them, but because the central metaphor of Deep Space Nine is, I think, for the most part, a Holocaust metaphor. I think for the most part, we're meant to take the Cardassian occupation of Bajor as a metaphor for the Holocaust. And in that metaphor, the Cardassians are in the role of the Nazis. Now, I also think the Cardassians, as we see them, are a totalitarian state. And I think they do have a lot in common with the Nazis in terms of how they conduct themselves. But the big reason for considering them the Nazis is that they are in the Nazi place in the central metaphor of the show. Um, oh, super chat from Sean Hartley. Thank you so much. Uh, been a while since I have caught you on an ask away. Here's a bit to keep the lights on. Uh, thoughts on what a mirror universe Q would be like. Ooh, you know, here's an interesting suggestion. Maybe there isn't a mirror universe Q. Maybe Q is just Q. Like maybe the Q continuum exists across all of the multiverse. So Q is aware of the mirror universe and maybe he even goes and hangs out there sometimes, but there's not a mirror universe Q. It's just Q everywhere. You know, although if, if that's not the case, and if there is a Q just for the mirror universe or a Q that is native to the mirror universe, I guess he, he would be a really nice guy, right? With not much of a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> it did not go up my nose. It came out of the can, but it did not go up my nose. Um, some random geek says, should we destigmatize asking for money in our society? Uh, Americans blame themselves for their situation as opposed to the system, for example. Yeah, I think we should destigmatize it. Absolutely. I think if uh, there shouldn't be shame in asking for help that you need. Um, I think it's an understandable human response to feel that embarrassment, but it's not necessary. Like, I do feel like we should feel free to do that if, it's, if, if we are in that position. Uh, Lex Hart, if you could erase an episode of Star Trek from history, which would it be? Um, probably Code of Honor, that super racist episode from the first season of TNG. Uh... And by the way, I know I, I think I, I skipped a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, so if I missed your question, uh, and it was a good question, I, I apologize for that. Um, uh, Johnny McSeabisca, drifting away from the Star Trek universe. Have you watched The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina? It's really good. Also, I want to say hello from Germany. Are you in New York City in March? I want to meet you. Um, I've not watched the new Sabrina show, so I can't talk to you about that. So sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for the hello from Germany. And I do not plan to be in New York City in March. So sorry about that. I don't think we'll be able to meet there. Uh, but if my plans change, I'll let you know. But no, no plans to be in NYC in March at the moment. Um, Uh, Lord Javi 131. I'm actually down to the bottom of I'm down to the bottom of the chat. Um, would the last episode of DS9 have been a great movie? Bigger space battles and a scene of the retaking of Beta Z. Um, yeah, I think it probably could have been. Sure, it was epic enough. You know, I think I think the last episode of DS9 could have been a great movie. A uh, Way of the Warrior could have been a good movie too. It had the epic scope and was kind of presented. As a movie, I think Way of the, Way of the Warrior would have been a good would have been a good movie too. Um, Two fifty five A D. Uh, Eli told YouTube shitlords they should try to meet you in person if they want to connect to you personally. Um, how would you react if they actually tried to arrange that? Well, if they tried to arrange it with me, I would refuse. I don't want to meet any of them. I mean, I I appreciate the thought that Eli was making there. Like, I, it's a good it's 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 a a good insight into the way the internet works. Like, if you if you want to connect personally with someone, don't come at them online. Like, you know, meet them in person and strike up a conversation and get to know them. Like, I think he's completely on the money there. But I would not want to knowingly meet or hang out with people who have harassed me on the internet myself. Like if, if somebody tried to arrange it, the answer would be no, you know, they can all go to hell as far as I'm concerned. But the, the thought on Eli's part is a good one. I think, uh, there is an, a super chat from John Gingras. Thank you, John. I just got back from my birthday dinner. Hope you all had a great holiday and we'll have a great new year. Thank you so much. And same to you, my friend. Um, 
C uh, Seal 0626. It feels significant to me that the Star Trek that the, that the Star Wars space Nazis have the Hugo Boss look, and the Cardassians don't. Like it's to deny them that little bit of. But they were stylish. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, but I mean the Cardassians still get that anyway. Like there's still lots of people who don't get how Gul Dukat was a bad guy. <laughs> you know they they can't necessarily play the stylish card, um, but. Like they, Cardassians still get, there's still a, a, an uncomfortable level of apologetics for the Cardassians in the fan base as it is. But you're right, that's a good point. And I feel like that's, um, you know, I, obviously that was a very intentional design choice uh, for Star Wars because the Empire, uh, the Empire are meant to, to stand in the place of Nazis in the metaphor for that series as well. Um, uh, Matthew Datcher just saw the news that Don Imus died. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, I saw that before the uh, the premiere for the uh, the stuffy video started. Yeah, I have very mixed feelings about that. Like Don Imus, obvious, obviously, uh, you know, when he got fired, he deserved to be fired, and he said a lot of really, really shitty things over the years. Uh, but I also used to listen to his show, so it's like one of those things where, like, I remember being a fan of it, even though now I realize I probably shouldn't have been a fan of it. But there's still like a lingering sort of nostalgia or attachment to it, so it's it's a very strange feeling to have. But yeah, I, I saw that as well. Um, Super chat from Shirley Singleton. I love your work. Would like to see more frequent ensigns logs. I'm all caught up on that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, new ensigns log went up today. Actually, I think it might have gone up yesterday. Actually, but it, usually new ensigns logs go up every other Friday. So uh, yeah, I hope, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you caught up and now you have to wait for the new episodes. Isn't that the worst when you're listening to a podcast and, and you catch up and then you like, oh, now I have to wait for new episodes. That's the worst. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, we're continuing to do the ensigns log. We'll do the, en uh, Jason and I will do the ensigns log until one of us is dead. I'm quite sure. Um, Uh, CLO626, the Borg face in the latest trailer, nearly but not quite Picard. Daniel Stewart? If so, why him? Bataille was long dead by the time of the Borg. Standing for his dad to be CGI'd? What do you reckon? I don't know. Maybe they just, if it is Daniel Stewart, maybe they were just throwing the kids some work. Um, a trance in Star Trek, were there any natives of Alpha Centauri? I don't think so. I think Alpha Centauri is the site of a Federation colony. But I don't believe there are any natives of Alpha Centauri that I that that I am aware of. Uh, some random geek question: Is the patron hangout this Sunday? Yes, I did not have a patron hangout last month, but there will be one this month. It will be this Sunday, uh, Sunday at noon, as Sunday at noon Eastern, as usual. Yes, there will be a, a patron hangout. So if you are a Patreon patron, you can join me in the hangout, and if you are anybody else, you can watch live on YouTube uh, for an hour on Sunday, starting at noon Eastern. Yes, patron hangout this Sunday. Um, Wolfwood 438, any recommendations on good episodes to introduce friends to Star Trek? Uh, well, I think for, I, you probably have to go series by series. Like for uh, for the original series, I mean, Charlie X is a good one. Corbomite Maneuver is a good one. Um, Balance of Terror is a good one. For TNG, maybe... Um, Hmm, what's a good episode to introduce people to TNG? Uh, Measure of a Man is a good episode. There's a couple episodes in second season that are that are pretty strong episodes and and get you sort of establish the characters for you. Um, Deep Space Nine is probably best to start at the beginning or maybe start with uh, in season three, maybe the start of season three, the search, which is when they really they, when they introduce the uh, the founders and really start moving more toward the. Uh, the, the the dominion storyline uh yeah i don't know there 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 are there are limitless possibilities it's an it's a vast expansive franchise um okay yeah uh, zephram cochran was born on alpha centauri but he but he was an earther like he was um uh he was human you know he wasn't like a member of a species that was native to alpha centauri you know you see what i'm saying and like it was a colony it was an earth colony um
<laughs> Marty Abernathy, Don Imus died. The world just got a bit less racist. Yeah, you got, I got to, I got to give you that one. Um, uh, Gabriel Alexander, hello again, Steve. I've just discovered the late seating podcast. When it's a movie you don't like, do you watch all the way through, or do you take lots of breaks? Oh, I watch it all the way through. Uh, but Jason, Jason always see. Jason does the work of the two of us. So Jason always watch or almost always his custom is to watch the movies twice. And I know from him telling me about it that he does have to take breaks sometimes if it's a movie that he really, really doesn't enjoy. Uh, he does have to kind of watch it in shifts, but I, I only watch it once and I always watch it straight through, uh, usually the day before we record. Uh, John Burns, would I ever see you at TwitchCon? Probably not. Um... 255 AD, uh, could non-neurotypical people reclaim the R word? Yeah, I, I feel, I mean, uh, reappropriating a slur is, I feel like that's, you know, that's a matter for that community. You know what I mean? So if you are someone who might be the the target of a slur like the R word and you and, and folks like you decide to turn it around and try to reclaim it, that to me is, is, is a matter of, for you all. Like, I don't feel like I have any part in that. So yeah, I guess the answer is yes, but it's not really up to me. Um, uh, Sean Hartley, would you like a Star Trek series based in the Andromeda galaxy? Uh, some tech is developed to get there and they explore the galaxy thoughts. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, it was, you could sort of do a, a, another version of Voyager just instead of lost on the other side of our galaxy, they could be lost in the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessary. I think Star Trek has established its universe such that if you want to do an, a Star Trek show about exploring territory that humans or the Federation has not yet explored, like you can, you can, there's still plenty of the Milky Way that you could set the show in. But yeah, you could do the Andromeda Galaxy. I'm not like absolute. I'm not super hot for it, but sure. I mean, it, it could. Yeah. Um, uh, some random geek says opinions on Vosh, if any. My opinions on Vosh is he is a douche that defends his rights to use slurs while being cishet, white, able-bodied dude. I have never watched a single moment of a Vosh video. Like I've never watched his, his debates or his appearances with other people. I've never, I've never watched a single second. My, the impression I get from hearing other people talk about him is that I would think he was an asshole. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. And your thought, your following comment saying that he, Vosh thinks shoe on head should be welcome on the left. I think shoe on head shouldn't be welcome anywhere. I think shoe on head is a piece of garbage. So if that is Vosh's opinion, then we have a very strong disagreement there because shoe on head is a, is a dishonest, bigoted person who should not be welcome on the left or anywhere where decent people would like to congregate. Um, <laughs> seal 0626 in a decade's time will late seating cover the cat's monstrosity speaking as a musical theater lover with a deep abiding fondness for the show it looks like a dumpster fire i think the cats movie is if we needed motivation to keep late seating going for another 10 years i think the cats movie is all we would need and if we ever got to the point where we were going to end the show for some reason before 10 years had passed and we had reviewed the Cats movie, I would ask Jason that we make an exception and and sneak the Cats movie in under the wire and review that at least before we we end the show because I would I would love to do a late seating about the Cats movie because it sounds just indescribable. So yeah, I would totally love to do Cats on late seating at some point. Um oh, thank you Marty. I'm glad you liked the Mommy Dearest review. Um Uh, Valsh is pansexual. Okay, well, good for Valsh. Uh, I guess I guess because because some random geeks said that Valsh was uh, cis cis hetero, right? So okay, well there you go. We stand corrected. Um, yeah, some random geek just said he's still a douche, and he has if and if that is true, and he's a sex pest and has harassed others, then that's then that's another reason to throw him on the shit list. Um, 
<laughs> John Bird says, so Steve, the Washington Potatoes football team. I don't know what they changed the name to, but they should definitely change it to something. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, 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 I know it's funny. I was talking to Ashley about this the other day. I don't, I don't remember how we got on the subject, but I thought I said, isn't it just ridiculous that this is even a fucking argument? If the football team was named for a slur, any other slur, would we? If if they if they were the Washington N words, would we be having this fucking discussion? Oh, but it's been the team name for a hundred years. Oh, no, so. <laughs> like of of course they should change the name of course they should they should have changed the name 40 or 50 years ago of course they should change the name of the washington football team it's ridiculous that we're even talking about it uh oh leto thank you very much jason is i i, I say jason is the funny one and i genuinely believe that he is the key to the show but i appreciate you um talking up my contribution to the show as well. Actually, I, I was listening to our Return of the Jedi review last week, and I don't want to toot my own horn. Uh, Self-praise is cheap praise. But there were a few moments of mine that, that genuinely made me laugh that I had forgotten about. And, uh, and, and I, so I will, I will grudgingly admit in all modesty that there are times when I'm happy with my contributions to late seating as well. My George Lucas voice. My doing the George Lucas voice like it's Larry Flint. I don't know. That's cheap, but it makes me laugh every time. And it's so goddamn fun to do. It's so fun to do George Lucas as Larry Flint. I just don't, I can't describe how much fun that is. Um, how would you, uh, Sean Hartley says, how would you explain the internet and mobile phones to someone from the middle ages? They got time traveled to the present and it was up to you to explain it. I mean, I guess I would just kind of let them play with it and let them figure it out. Like, how could you explain it to someone with that, with so little frame of reference? You just have to let them acclimate to it, right? Um, okay, we are past the usual time when uh, I wrap these. Uh, oh, J did you, did John have questions that I missed? $5 questions that I missed? Um, I don't think I saw those, John. Um Oh, 25580, who is Larry Flint? Larry Flint is uh, the founder of Hustler magazine. He was a pornographer of note, and he talked like this. Hi, I'm Larry Flint, and this is how I do George Lucas's voice. Well, my Robert Zemeckis isn't even... My Robert Zemeckis is just me yelling with a, with a randomly applied accent. Um... So, uh, John, if, if you can repost your, you know, obviously you don't have to donate the $5 again, but if you can, if you can remind me of what your questions were, cause I did not see them. If I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, uh, Yannick Muller, can you pitch us the version of the rise of Skywalker <laughs> of the rise of Skywalker? You would like to have seen no some renegade Larry. I think he may have had a stroke at some point. Um, but actually it, it's, it, yeah, he was, uh, he was shot. I think he may have had a stroke after that, but he, he was, he was shot. And I think his voice was kind of like that to begin with. But yeah, I, 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 I recognize what you're saying that I'm, I'm treading close to uh, like mocking a, a disabled person for their disability. And obviously that's not what I want to do. So, um, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Um, what would my version of the rise of Skywalker? I mean, Rose would have been in it a lot more and Palpy would have been in it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I haven't really given it much thought. Um, okay, I'm gonna. I'm, okay, now I'm, I'm seriously. I'm seriously going to call it off. And uh, uh, John, if I missed your your super chat questions, I apologize. Um, but uh, but I I must I must have missed them because I scrolled up and I didn't see them. So anyway, I'm going to turn away from the chat now. Uh, thank you all so, so much for watching. I want to remind you as always to please go to the description of this video and check out the charity links to help out some of our friends who are uh, in need. I realize it's the holidays and a lot of us are short on cash because it's the holidays and a lot of us are short on cash just in general. But if you can afford to donate a little bit, please do. And if you can't afford it, uh, please consider sharing the links and letting other people have a chance to donate. Uh, we, I know we would all really, really appreciate it. Um, 
I also want to remind you that in, a, that, uh, in addition to the, uh, the YouTube stuff, I co-host a couple of podcasts that we've been d- discussing a little bit, thanks to some questions in the chat. Uh, the uh, Let Me Listen family of podcasts. I am the uh, co-host, along with Jason, of Late Seating, the movie review podcast, and the Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast. Uh, you can listen to them both at lemmelistenpodcasts.com, or uh, you can subscribe via RSS using your favorite podcast app or listen on Sound cloud or there are links in the description listen to them however you want there's a brand new ensign's log that just went up today and last week was our re- our late seating review of the return of the jedi so check those out those are excellent and uh, i actually i i laughed at as i mentioned to Lado anna earlier i i got myself to laugh at my own shit which happens a lot to be fair i i laugh at my own shit a lot i just try not to do it in public so much because it's gauche um You can support me on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives. A patron uh, membership of any amount enables you to ask questions for Ask Away early. And I always answer pre-submitted patron questions before I turn to the live chat. So that's a little benefit you get. And this weekend is my monthly uh, live hangout with some patrons where we all do a a live stream together on camera. Um, uh, A patron of any level is eligible to at least try, get a spot in the room. It's sort of first come first serve. Uh, But, uh, and anybody can watch if, if you want, and patrons can join me live on the air. It will be Sunday, uh, beginning at noon Eastern time. So check that out and patreon.com slash Steve Shives to support the channel and help me continue what I'm doing here on YouTube. Thank you all so, so, so very much for watching. Thank you all for the questions. Um, I appreciate spending this time with you. I hope you all had a good holiday. Those of you who are celebrating Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or whatever you were celebrating these past couple weeks, have a happy, happy new year. And I will see you next month, year, and decade. (laughs) Take care, everybody.